First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the summer school for inviting me. It's um, again a pleasure to be in Madrid. Um, the other thing is it's really a bit strange to get be introduced in a language you can't understand <laughs> beside your own name. So I hope she said only nice things. Um, yeah, I will talk today about face re or face cognition and brain activity. And I think you agree with me that every day we see so many faces in our environment that face cognition must be important for us in social situations. Um, please be honest, who does know this guy? <laughs> ah, only a half. So even people who don't recognize this person can infer a lot of information from just seeing this face. First of all, this guy looks very European-like, so it's a Caucasian face, I would say. Maybe with some Latin influences. Um, second point, it's a male person. Third, you have information about his age. So this is an adult person, rather young. And at this picture, at least, he looks rather happy or satisfied, so just in a good state. Some of you might say now, well, this person looks really attractive. So but that's really your personal opinion. And um, we know from a lot of studies that people who are um, evaluated as attractive are seen as very successful. So some of you might say, okay, this person is a successful person because he looks attractive. So we know that from social relationships, also from job offers and so on. Some of you might say, no, I think this guy is not attractive, but now. Every one of you who knows these people will agree on that point that this person is successful because people who recognize successfully this face know that this person is Cristiano Ronaldo. Born in 85, so the young adultness seems to be true. He is still playing at Real Madrid, I think, as far as I know. And he is one of the most successful soccer players in the world because if you have the biographical knowledge about him, you know that he was the most expensive transfer ever done in Europe for I don't know how many millions. Um, he is the head of the Portuguese national team. You have to be a successful football player if you can get this position there. And he was awarded as world soccer player for several time, uh, times, I think. And you know that he is earning lots of money. So he is indeed successful. You are right with all those things. Importantly, and face recognition is that and it's even more important in your personal life when you meet family members or your friends is that you recognize successfully this face, even you see the face in different contexts and that also in different situations, like here. So face cognition seems to be very, very relevant in social life. So they are highly important, faces are highly important objects for humans and also for other primates because they convey information about the identity of others, their emotional states, their gender, their age, and they support in that way nonverbal and also verbal behavior and communication to others. So because we are highly social species, um, it seems that the fast and accurate identification of other individuals as well as their internal, uh, internal states and intentions and also their suitability as social partners and potential mates is very, very important for us. So thus, we suggested that face cognition may be one aspect of this emotional intelligence. So, Today, and you can imagine that it's really a complex issue to speak about face cognition and it's impossible to talk about every aspect of 
um, face cognition, thus I decided to pick out some aspects I really personally am interested in. Um, I would like to introduce you just shortly and superficially um, some of the established neurocognitive models of face recognition. I will talk a bit about the modules assumed there, some components and the suggested sub-processes. I will then pick out two main aspects. The first is the face perception and structural encoding of faces. I will talk here about electrophysiology, um, physiological correlates, that's um, ERP components, and then about the assumed phase specificity of those components, and I will also shortly introduce another model coming from our group. Um, and in the last or second part, I will speak about the time course of socio-emotional phase processing, which is um, I will, I will uh, focus on ERP components of emotional expression recognition in faces. I will talk about their domain specificity and um, about some boundary conditions of their appearance um, over time. Um, coming to the first model, I think it's really one of the most influential and also most prominent model in cognitive psychology and I guess every one of you has seen it already. Um, this is the model, the cognitive model of face recognition assumed by Bruce and Young in um, 86. It's uh, yeah, more than a quarter century ago now when they introduced it. It's really a um, widely accepted model in that area. So what do they assume? They assume that when you see a face, in the first step, you have the perceptual analysis of this face. In the very first step, depending on the, um, on the profile you see, so whether you see it from front of you or from, from the profile. So you have this view-centered description. That's really low-level perception up to here. And then, at a, the next stage, you get to some expression-independent description. So what you analyze at this stage, what they call structural encoding, is all the features of a face and their arrangement, their spatial arrangement to each other. This leads to a result, what they call face recognition units. So you have this holistic face percept in your mind and you match it against other face recognition units you have in your memory. So it's a matching with other face um, descriptions you have in mind. And if you then recognize a person, so if your percept matches to something in, stored in your memory, you get um, access to biographical knowledge you have stored with that face. Like I've tried to show you in the very beginning, um, Cristiano Ronaldo, the soccer player, and so on. So here you have, at this stage, you have the activation of so-called person identity nodes. And then most of you might be successful in generating also the name of the person but you might know several situations where you failed. Like, oh, I know this person, I definitely know the face, I recognize the person, but the name generation is disrupted. So this is one branch they postulate, and um, what they also assume, and that's really relevant for this talk, because I will come back to this aspect again and again later on, is that they assume that the expression analysis, that is the analysis of the emotional expression in the face, is a parallel route to this identity branch. So what we are interested in as psychologists and also neuroscientists is the neurocognitive system which 
intermediates between our environment where we see all those faces like I see your faces now here in front of me to our behavior. So what is happening in that black box in between? And um, Hexby and colleagues suggested in 2000 the first um, neurocognitive model um, suggesting the neural systems which are um, responsible for each of the sub-processes postulated in the model of Bruce and Young. So this is now just only rotated. You will get uh, back to the Bruce and Young model. So what they say is that the early perception of facial, facial uh, features, this perceptual analysis, happens in the in inferior oxyvital gyri. So this, which is part of the core system for the visual analysis of the, um, of the face we see. And from here, you have activation to the um, superior temporal sulcus and to the lateral fusiform gyrus. In this area here, there um, happens the analysis of changeable aspects of faces, so like the perception of eye gaze, eye movements, so where does the person, the face look to? Um, also expression and, and uh, the lip movements of faces speak what they usually do. Like I do now, you not. Um, and um, on the other hand, information is transferred to the lateral fusiform gyrus where invariant aspects of faces are analyzed, like the perception of the unique identity of the person. And of course, those two systems are highly connected, strongly connected and interact with each other. So from here, um, information goes to several other areas in the brain, which they call, Hexby and colleagues, the extended systems. So, for instance, um, information about um, lip movements is further analyzed in the auditory cortex. And of course, if we are talking about um, emotional expression and the recognition of emotional expressions, all those areas which are involved in emotion processing seems to be involved, like here the amygdala and the limbic system. And again, separated from that, they assume that the anterior temporal cortex is responsible for, um, yeah, for the matching of the incoming information with the person um, with the biographical knowledge. Um, here, aspects like the personal identity, the name, and biographical information are stored and then activated again. I think this is um, currently uh, in the focus of discussion. So there are a lot of heterogeneous um, evidence, but this is just to give you a rough overview about the brain areas involved. And you can see again that um, this all seems to be a rather complex thing. So besides um, looking at neural correlates in terms of where does processes um, be in the brain, where are they located, um, we could use another methodological approach to look into this black box of the neurocognitive systems and those, um, these tools are event-related brain potentials and I don't know how familiar you are with um, ERP so I've decided to shortly introduce it again. So event-related brain potentials reflect the neuronal activity and allow that insight into the neurocognitive system. So what we usually do in such studies uh, that, that we present stimuli in the brain depending on the question of research we have in mind. And then we record um, brain activity from the Skype surface. Has someone of you attended to such a study in the lab somewhere? No one. Only a few. <laughs> okay. So what we are 
so then I will go a bit more into detail maybe. Um, so what we are doing is we are presenting stimuli of interest in front of the participant and then we record brain activity from different electrode sites from the surface which are usually placed in an electrode cap, so to say. And with these recordings, we do a lot of mathematical algorithms. I won't explain them now. But at the end, we have an average, let's say, wavelet over time, um, which provides a lot of information I will um, tell you later on about what is happening in the brain between the stimulus presentation and the behavior we could measure from the participant, the overt behavior, for instance. The nice thing of ERPs is that they give us information about the different sub-processes happening between stimulus presentation and the response. So what we can do is we can segregate everything happening between we, we see something and we behave to that into different stages. And um, because what, what we can do is that we have different components of ERPs. I will give you concrete examples later, which can be directly related to different stages, to different sub-processes. Coming back to the model of Bruce and Young, um, this means that we could segregate processes in the brain which can be related to early perceptual analysis, then to the, face, uh, the activation of face recognition units, person identity nodes, and so on, just by looking at different components of this event-related potentials. So those ERPs have a low spatial but a very high temporal um, resolution. What I forgot to say is that we are measuring those activity um, in milliseconds. Like every second or fourth millisecond, we get one measure point over time. They provide richer information and performance alone. Um, they provide information, even in the case we don't have any performance effects and they indicate ongoing processing in real time. So we can look at every moment into the brain. Um, here I have uh, plotted just an example of an um, e event related potential and a specific component. Um, what you can see here is the activation over time in milliseconds at a single electrode depicted here. It's the CZ electrode, which is really the middle of the head surface over here, the vertex. And what you can see here is that at a given point of time, those two curves, which are the ERPs in response to two different experimental conditions, differ from each other. And you can see here that in one condition you have a larger deflection to the negative direction, which we call the amplitude of a component. So you can see here that in this example, um, the, the line or the condition here elicits a component with a larger amplitude than the other condition does. And um, the idea behind is that these amplitude differences reflect differences in the strength of activation of a given uh, pool of neurons. The second aspect, and I think that's the most interesting one for most of ERP researchers, is the latency. That means at which specific time point do those conditions differ from each other? At this time, in this example, you can see that here those curves start to differ at about 300 milliseconds here. So which means that at the latest, at this time point, our brain can detect 
difference between those two conditions. And the last one is the topography, which provides us at least indirect information of the neural generators behind those ERP components. The topography is, means the sky distribution of the given component over the head surface. What you can see here is this negativity, which has a negative in all my uh, later slides as well, is here plotted in blue positivities. Um, are always plotted in red. My friends and colleagues from this unit here are laughing about me because we were discussing about this for several times. <laughs> um, so what you can see here is that this negativity, which means this negative deflection here, you can see here over time, at this time point is maximal over this electrode side, over this area, this point at the Skype surface. And this um, means, oh, that's hard to say now about the neural generators, <laughs> would be very speculative now. Um, so given the Skype distribution over this area here, I wouldn't say that this component should indicate some early visual processing because it's far away from the visual cortex more to the center of the head. Is that okay, Manuel? Okay. So these are aspects of information we can receive from ERP components. And that's the difference in comparison to brain activity measured by functional imaging where we don't have this time information. So where we don't have information about pr the processing over time. Coming back to the model. Oh, wow. Um, Coming back to the model of Bruce and Yang, there are several of such components of interest in the area of face cognition. So as many aspects you have in the face, as many components you have, I would say. Um, I will just shortly give you examples of the uh, um, correlates, the ERP components related to this very early or this initial steps of face recognition. I won't have the time to talk about um, these later components. And as I said, I would like to introduce shortly correlates of the expression analysis. Um, they are labeled already here. I will explain them later on. So let's start with the structural encoding of faces. Ah, okay, and I forgot to say it's always that it's delayed here than um, in comparison to there. Sorry for being confused sometimes. Um, I would just give you some examples about this discussion whether we have really independent parallel routes of expression analysis and the identitive branch uh, based on ERP evidence we have at the moment. So first of all, the P100, just to, um, to show you how this component looks like, the P100 um, is elicited by every kind of visual stimulus. So whenever you change something um, in the periphery, you will get this very early component. It's peaking about 100 milliseconds very nicely and clearly peaking and it's just the first indicator of uh, visual perception and you can, this is now a gray shaded um, topography, sorry for that. So just think everything in gray as uh, blue and everything in white as red again. So this P100 is mostly enhanced over um, the visual cortex and it's uh, presumably generated in the V2 area of the brain. That's why it's located here. So whenever you look at ERP literature on face recognition, you will find this component as the first one which is described by the authors. And um, because it's really a very, very tough discussion at the moment, and it would took me at least one hour to to uh, describe you the, yeah, this field at the moment. Currently there is a big 
discussion about whether this P100 is already phase sensitive. So whether the P100 to phases is different from the P100 you get, for instance, in response to um, a blue square. Um, the most prominent ERP component in this context, I would say, is the, the so-called N170. So the N170 um, was firstly shown, I think, from Shlomo Benton and colleagues um, in, 60, uh, in 96, sorry, um, where they showed participants' faces and scrambled faces and cars and scrambled cars, and what they found was this negative deflection around 170 milliseconds uh, peaking. That's the reason why it's called N170, um, which was much more enhanced to phases in comparison to all the other uh, stimulus categories. And what Benton and colleagues suggested then was that the N170 may reflect the operation of a neural mechanism tuned to detect human faces similar to the structural encoder suggested by Bruce and Young. So he really made, for the first time, or they made this direct link to um, this stage um, suggested in the, in the model of Bruce and Young. And um, even though there is, a, is some discussion, so this N117 has been related to the configurable processing of phase features and their integration into a holistic phase percept, so into the phase percept as a whole. And this is really based, these assumptions are based on the fact that you have found in several studies this enhanced peak to phases in comparison to all other stimulus categories. And also that whenever you interrupt this holistic phase processing, which you can do by, for instance, just inverting the phase you present to the participants, where you have to make additional integration processes of the features, because you have to rotate the, the whole um, percept you have, then this N170 is, um, appears later in time, so it appears delayed in comparison to upright phases, or it uh, shows larger amplitudes, as we have recently replicated and, and yeah. <coughs> so the N170 um, shows this, you can see here the distribution over um, the sky surface, this um, negative poles at this um, posterior electrode sites and um, as a counterpart, the frontocentral positivity over there. And um, thus it was to suggested, and there is also some evidence from MEG and also dipole analysis that the generators, the neural generators of the N170 are located in the lateral fusiform gyrus. You might have heard about the so-called fusiform phase area. which would be in line with, um, with the assumptions of um, Hexby and colleagues. Um, based on those studies, and there are lots of studies, I promise you, so if, if you just make a literature research in PubMed and you, you insert their face recognition and ERP components, you will get hundreds of studies. Um, so all this research led to the, to the question, what is special about phases? And there must be something special in comparison to other um, domains. Because we have so many phases around us and we have so many people we have met during our life and we are more or less very good performers in face recognition. So I'm able to to recognize uh, Pilar Casado again after not seeing her for six months or something like that. So, wow. <laughs> um, and 
the suggestion was that this is really due to the fact that we have some holistic or configurable processing mechanisms that are especially employed for phases. As um, has been experimentally demonstrated in part whole phase inversion and composite uh, phase effects. So it seems that we are really expert for phases and we have also this, it, or it has been suggested that there is this kind of phase specific holistic processing that we can see and match and store a holistic phase percept in our mind. And this specialness, but I think I run out of time. That was really only because you wished that from me. The specialness of phase perception relative to general cognitive functioning and object cognition has been also supported not only on those experimental effects, but also on the basis of individual differences. As I will just shortly demonstrate with the next picture, and please don't be shocked. I will just pick out the most relevant things. So what we have done in a rather huge project, we are in a lot of um, studies with, large, um, with rather large um, uh, sample sizes. For instance, this is one study with about uh, 150 participants. What we did is we conducted a lot of um, different tasks measuring different abilities. For instance, um, we implemented in that huge battery some tasks measuring only object cognition and nothing else in object cognition. We have implemented here a lot of tasks measuring general cognition, um, memory abilities, mental speed like the speed of our working, working memory and so on. And we newly conducted really based on a lot of experimental stuff done during the last decades and um, tasks which are um, investigating different aspects of face recognition. And the most important thing here now is that after running a lot of um, factor analysis, um, we found that on the one hand, on the accuracy level, we can separate indeed face perception and face memory as two aspects of face cognition, which would be in line with the sequential branch of, um, of the Bruce and Young model. So we could, but we really could segregate those two factors and we got one common factor which is called the speed of face cognition. So that means um, in terms of this inter-individual differences that um, we could distinguish between good and bad performers, people who are really fast on face perception and people who are really slow in face perception. And the most important thing is that um, based on all those analysis, we could show that general cognition is not the same as face cognition, which means, in other words, people, so those are two different aspects. People who are good performers in their in general cognition tasks are not just good in face cognition. Is that clear up to this point? Um, I will just skip that now. But coming back to the ERP components, what we also have done, and this, this is the relevant point, I think. What we also have done is, so if there is this factor of speed of face cognition and those components, the P1 and the N170, are directly related to this initial processing, we should find some relationships between the speed of face cognition and at least the latency of those components which we didn't, which clearly speaks against the idea that those two components are direct indicators of um, the face perception. Um, 
Okay, that was the first part just on the face perception stuff and I have a hope that you are not disappointed now and confused and say, oh, there's more unclear than clear up to now. But um, yeah, so to say the first conclusion would be there's a lot of research to be done in the future. So coming to the um, third part or the second part is um, the time course of social em emotional phase processing, mainly the uh, processing of emotional expressions. So um, I will focus he now here on, on this part of the model. I said in the very beginning that um, Cristiano Ronaldo looks happy or let's say more satisfied. And um, you have seen also in this picture as well, you will recognize this person again here but showing a totally different expression. And I think every one of us would agree that he is looking sad here. I mean, it has nothing to do with that expression here. And importantly, um, it seems that also other persons can show nearly exactly the same expression. I was really, so, um, I was impressed when I, when I found this picture. So this is a German soccer player. And uh, so they lost the game and it's, it's, it looks so similar. Yeah? And even though you are not personally involved in that situation, you just see this lost game, you can f obviously share the same emotion. Um, kids do it. Uh, prominent persons get angry or something like this if they make mistakes. You can find this also in cartoons and you would also here recognize the same expression as uh, Barack Obama shows before. You can find similar expressions in non-human primates um, as depicted in, in those two examples. So and just, just the fact that you find it in your early personal development and also early in, um, in, in, in primates um, led to the suggestion that those emotional expressions are yeah, evolutionarily relevant and established in our life. And um, I would really recommend you to read the very, very early book of Darwin in 1872 the expression of emotion in man and animal, where you can find his observations of emotional expressions also in cats, I think, and blind uh, children and so on. So it's really not our new ideas here. So emotional facial expressions provide crucial information for social interaction. I think that's clear because they provide information about others' emotional states. And already yesterday I was thinking about and that we really need this emotional theory of mind as the two ladies were um, assuming in their early talks because if I just recognize the, um, the, the emotional expression in another face, I don't need any information about the context, what happened to that moment that this person might now feel sad or something like that. So you can get this information very directly. And um, I think this is also, there's consensus about this assumption that the rapid and correct recognition of facial expressions also entails an ad adaptive advantage in our behavior. Because we can get information about the environment. For instance, if you just remember this little girl looking a bit angry, this might signal us danger in our environment. And then you can, of course, adapt your behavior. So you can, um, or just recognizing this expression might elicit appropriate responses and inhibit inappropriate actions. So it's better to fly it then. Um, so the main questions of my research in that um, area is, what are the electrophysiological correlates or what are the exact um, ERP components of emotional expression processing, which means again, what is the time course 
of emotion processing when we look at faces. Um, and then as some sub-questions, um, are those effects um, special for facial expressions or are they, let's say, the same as in other domains? Are they independent of the identity branch of face recognition just in relation to the model I have introduced? This is more, I think, a general question in emotion processing. Um, is the recognition of emotional expressions automatic and if so, to which degree is it fully automatic or not? Um, and what are boundary conditions? And um, depending on the time left, I will show you now some of our own studies. So let's start with the first two questions um, here. Um, and what a lot of researchers have shown, especially in the beginning of the 2000s years, was that emotional stimuli, particularly affective pictures, elicited at least two distinguishable ERP components. This has now nothing to do with face recognition in the beginning, but I will give you the link then. The first is the early posterior negativity. You have again a um, larger negativity at posterior electrode sites in response to emotional compared to neutral pictures, as shown by Schupp, for instance, um, starting at around 150 milliseconds in most of the studies on effective pictures um, processing. And this component has been suggested to reflect involuntary attention and thus the allocation of perceptual resources. So if you are processing an emotional stimulus, you have this boost in attention and you have this allocation of perceptual resources which then leads to a sustained and elaborative processing at later processing stages, which should be reflected in the so-called late positive complex or late positive potential. And you can see here now this effect, again, in response to emotional stimuli as compared to neutral ones, not only appears later in time, around 450 milliseconds, it shows also another distribution, this is now um, the top view on, on the head, with the positivity over parietal electrodes here. So due to the time course and the topography, those two components can be really distinguished over time. So, and in a first step, we have tried to identify maybe the same or maybe other uh, ERP components in response to emotional stimuli of two different domains. One is the verbal domain and the other is the facial domain and we, we aim to compare those two, uh, the, the effects across those two domains. So what we did is we implemented two tasks in one experiment blockwise. Um, on the one hand, really replicating a lot of other studies I had um, done before, we uh, use the so-called lexical decision task where you show given words of a given language which are correct, intermixed with so-called pseudo-words or non-words. So this is where you just exchange one letter as in this example. So these are um, German examples, sorry for that, but I've run all those experiments in German. So, and those words differed in their emotional meaning. Um, and in order to compare emotion effects between those two domains, we conducted a task on, on faces which should be rather similar to the lexical decision task. And what we did is we, we used positive, that is happy faces, angry faces and neutral faces similar to the valence manipulation in words and um, we created some distractor stimuli which were neutral faces where we just blurred some part of the face so one internal feature 
of the face, which was the nose of here in that face. What we found replicating all our um, other results was an emotional effect in ERPs to words appearing about 400 milliseconds, which is rather late in comparison to the effect of pictures, but it makes sense if you keep in mind that words are symbols to us and have to be translated into meaning first. So, but looking at the topography, we found here this posterior negativity and there's a counterpart, this uh, frontal central uh, positivity over over here really looking like the EPN which has been shown before for in response to effect of pictures. In faces we found a very similar effect but this effect appears much earlier in time around 150 milliseconds here. But when we compared the topographies of those two effects across those two domains they did not differ significantly. So it really seems that in, at this early stage there is a common emotion detection mechanism implemented in our brain because similar topographies indicate at least partly overlapping um, neuron pools in our brain. Five, wow. So let's speed up. Um, I will make it short. At later stages, we found this late positive complex, as I have um, shown you before, for effective pictures. And the, the most relevant thing is that even though these late, uh, this, this late effect of emotion appeared at similar latencies in both domains, um, it showed some differences in the distribution, which indicates different brain areas involved in this later stages of emotion processing. Um, we replicated or we tried to replicate those results uh, in a task which is much more superficial because you could say now well at this very late stage you have totally different requirements implemented in your task because responding to a somehow blurred face is a different thing than to respond uh, to a correct word or a distracted word. So what we did is a study where we just implemented a very, very superficial task. We presented faces showing different expressions intermixed with words of different valences like this angry face, a neutral face, then the word traurig which is sad, um, a happy face, the word to kiss, the word program, and so on. And people just had to indicate whether the stimulus seen on the desk is a word or a face, nothing else. So you don't have to read the word, you don't have to, um, to look deeply into the face because it's very, very easy to, to say it as, and most importantly, it doesn't matter whether the word or the face is positive, negative, or neutral. And what we found here is, um, this is the, the main result of this. If the task is that superficial and easy, we found this posterior negativity effects only for faces and not for words, which shows that the impact of emotional information from faces seems to be much more important that's, uh, it's, it's important in a degree that your brain has to process it. And now I have one minute, I think. Okay, let's think about what is really necessary. Um, I will, just to come back to the model, what we have found in all our studies, and now you have to believe me because I can't show you all the pictures um, on that, is even though our very early emotion effects to, to facial expressions look very similar to the N170, whenever we directly compared emotion effects to the N170 we found to 
just in response to neutral phases. The topography differed. That means the N170, in our opinion, is not, um, is not sensitive for emotional aspects. And I have to skip that. Wow, I'm always faster than, than planned. Now it's really the, the opposite. I will come to the conclusion, sorry. Um, what we could show in our studies is that, of course, emotional facial expressions elicit distinguishable effects in ERPs. Um, we have no evidence for a domain that means face sensitive or for a face sensitivity of these emotional effects. It's really the same effects we found in response to pictures, in response to words. But the only difference that sometimes we have it, um, they appear faster to faces that, for instance, to words, which, which I think totally makes sense. Um, and the other difference that sometimes we found effects to faces which we don't find for, or don't, didn't find for, uh, for emotional words, which just gives a, yeah, a hint to the particular relevance of emotional facials. Um, forget about this, I couldn't show you the, uh, um, the data of that. I think I could um, go to this one. The N170 is uh, not emotion sensitive, we have tested it again and again and we uh, really found, um, or we really replicated this again and again, but, and that's now important and I will then really come to the end. This does not indicate separate branches for emotion and identity, I would say it. Rather, it counts into question what exactly is indexed by the N170 component, I would say. And maybe we can discuss it in the evening. Um, because this is really an open topic um, at the, or an open issue. I just would like to show you the names of all my collaborators in Berlin and Ulm and so on. Um, and I thank you for your attention.